Have you ever messed up and been given a second chance? What did you do with that second chance? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome to OneChurch.tv online. We're so glad that you chose to hang out with us today, whether that be on Facebook Live, on YouTube, or on our One Church app. Today, we're in part three of a series we're calling Hope in the Dark, where we're looking at different storms th found throughout the entire Bible. Today, Pastor Carlo is going to be looking at the storm that Jonah was in. So glad that you chose to hang out with us today. If you haven't already, make sure to text CONNECT1C to 97000. And it's a way that you can stay up to date on what's happening in the life of our church. Right now, we're going to experience some worship, so thanks for tuning in. Come let us bow down his feet He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how his love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh, hero of heaven you conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awaken alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great Through every storm, you be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God. You do great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great
here, One Church, I want you to meditate on this song where things of this world can try to fill our minds and we don't understand it, but when you focus your worship on Jesus, everything changes. I search the world But he couldn't feel me Man's empty praise And treasure the spades Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire he is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountains is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. You 
Hey guys, we've come to the time in our service where we're going to give. It's normally we would actually pass around the buckets at the theater, but since we're at home, there are actually three different ways you can give. You can go to the onechurch.tv app and click give. You can go to our website, onechurch.tv, or you can mail in your cash and check. We want to say thank you so much for your sacrificial giving. Because you give, we're able to help so many different families in need. In fact, just yesterday, Mana Cafe had their mobile pantry at our Exit One location at the movie theater, and it had a great turnout. So thank you so much for being for Clarksville and for being for God. Guys, this Wednesday on May the 20th at 5 p.m., we're doing something called Engage. What is that all about? Well, one of the things that we do at OneChurch.tv is we measure engagements and next steps. And you can do that in four different ways. First, being connected in a small group. Second, serving on a team. Third is inviting somebody to church. And fourth is, of course, giving financially. If you do any one of those four things, I would love to invite you to this special time that's going to be on YouTube as well as the link is going to be on Facebook. And we're going to be addressing some of those nagging questions that you might have of, like, when are we going to be able to start meeting physically again? And what is that going to look like? So make sure to tune in this Wednesday, May the 20th at 5 p.m. We're so glad to have you there. You know, pain is a lonesome place. I don't have to tell you, do I? It'll drop a rock in your stomach right through your pounding heart. And when your knees are so weak, you hit the ground and you finally realize you don't got this. Well, now you might just make it. You see, the tallest tree may not weather the storm, but its roots do. So dig in. Stand up and let the wind blow. Because there's hope. What's up, OneChurch.tv? Carlo here. So glad that you are connecting with us today. When I was about nine or ten years old, my mother had this... A cabinet. It was made of all glass, and she kind of had some china in it, but it wasn't really a china cabinet, and she had a bunch of, like, knickknacks in it, although I don't know that that's what that cabinet was for. Basically, this thing looked like it belonged on the set of Miami Vice, and my mother decided it belonged in our living room, and so where it sat was really close to where I used to hang out watching TV. I'd lay on the floor and do all the kind of gymnastics a little nine, ten-year-old kid would do, and occasionally, my foot would just happen to bump against the bottom of her cabinet. Now, all the parents know that there's no occasionally in it. I was doing it on purpose. Um, But regardless of that, that's not the point. Don't get distracted. The point is my feet kept bumping into this thing. One day I got excited by something I watched on TV or maybe the little devil on my shoulder said, what if you push this cabinet? I don't really know. It's, It's fuzzy to me all these years later, but here's what I do know. I pushed that cabinet with my feet and it fell. And it was like something out of an action movie, slow motion as the cabinet is falling and I rolled out of the way. No, just in time. It smashed and everything shattered and broke. And my mom ran in already half having a stroke because she was so angry and she couldn't kill me because jail would be involved in that. She didn't know what to do with me. And I just kind of sat there doing what kids do when they know they did something. They say, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I did that. It was just one of those frustrating moments I know for her as a parent, I was terrified, not because I almost got shredded to death by all of the gaudy glass on her ugly cabinet. I was terrified because she sent me to my room and said, wait until your father 
comes home. Now, I'm from the generation where that means something and matters, and my father was a very uh, lovely man, loved God, great dad, but he was very intimidating uh, just to kind of be around. And so the thought that I was going to have to not only endure the wrath of my loud and raging mother, but I would have to endure the, the quiet storm that was my father just really was too much to handle. So I did what every kid in the 80s did. I went to my room and got into the bed thinking that, like on the television shows, if I just go to sleep, the, the nice music will play and dad will come in and say, oh, look how cute, and I won't get punished. Fact, that does not work. Um, not in my house. Many a time I have been spanked awake. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about uh, for, for trying to hide. So I go in, embracing for the worst. I hear my dad come home later that evening from work and hear my mom raging and yelling about what Carlo the Wicked did to her precious cabinet. And my dad comes down the hallway and it's, I mean, it's vivid. I hear every step. He gets to the door, opens the door and looks in and says, if I was to deal with you right now, I probably would hurt you. Just go to sleep. Terrifying. Shuts the door. So somehow I slept through the night, woke up the next morning, go into the kitchen, and there my parents are, and they didn't say anything to me about the event. They didn't mention it at all. They didn't bring it up at all. Uh, they just acted like nothing happened. I figured they, figured, they, they figured that I learned my lesson, and they gave me this amazing gift in that moment, which was a second chance. They knew I was scared, they knew it was ugly, they knew it was stuff that could just be replaced, and they gave me a second chance. And all these years later, I remember that as probably one of my top three stories in life of someone giving me a second chance when I blew it, when I went out of my way to mess up. How about you? Have you been given a second chance? Have you ever been given a second chance at life, a second chance at work, a second chance at relationships? Some of you, you've been given a second chance at life for sure. You've survived deployments and robberies and health issues. Maybe you've been given a second chance in your marriage, in a relationship that you messed up. Some of you, your life is like a 1990s R&B song. You're like Keith Sweat, always on one knee, begging for one more chance. And lo and behold, you get that one more chance over and over and over again. Look, in view of the second chances we've been given, especially in the current crisis that we are in, I think we all have an opportunity to grow. In fact, I think sometimes the storm is actually a second chance. What looks like chaos in the moment is actually a second chance, and we'll unpack that some in a few minutes. There's an old saying that most of us are either in a storm or we are about to walk into a storm or we're just coming out of a storm. And so because that's the reality that we find ourselves in, we have to learn how to get through what we are going through. So at OneChurch.tv, we're looking at famous storms from the Bible, found in the Bible, so that we can be reminded that we always have hope in the dark. Today, we're going to look at a story in the Hebrew Scriptures in the book of Jonah, a very famous story. It's often misunderstood story that involves a storm and see how this story, too, can give us some hope in the dark. Jonah is one of those books that's often viewed as a kid's story or a story of a guy and a big old fish, but there's so much more to that story than just that. The book of Jonah is, is not about the message of a prophet. In fact, I think there's only one actual prophecy spoken in the entire book of Jonah. As we follow Jonah's story, we see that this is a story about selfishness, this is a story about storms, and this is a story about second chances. Jonah isn't a book about a man and a fish. Jonah is a book about a man and his God. Jonah is a book about how God has used a storm to save many lives. Everything that we've been through as a world and as a church should cause us to wrestle with an important question, and it's this. What are you going to do with your second chance? What are you going to do with your second chance. So let's look at Jonah's story and see how this all unfolds. Jonah chapter one, it'll be on the screen or you can follow along uh, on your phone, version app, or you can follow along with an actual physical Bible if you have one. Here's what it says. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. So Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It's located about an hour north of what we now know of as Mosul, Iraq. Here, where OneChurch.tv meets locally in the Clarksville, Fort Campbell area, many of us lived in that region for a time during our deployments to Iraq. So we're familiar with Mosul. We're familiar with where Nineveh was. And the people of Nineveh, they engaged in the worst type of evil imaginable. And God wanted Jonah 
to be his mouthpiece to declare judgment on those people. Judgment is such a tough subject to talk about, especially in in our world and as we process uh, culture. Judgment is just a hard word for us. We want justice for others, but we don't really want anyone to judge us, right? We want the wicked to pay, but we don't want anyone to call us on our actions. So that's kind of a tough thing we have with judgment. And anytime crisis hits, especially the types of crisis we've gone through and that some of us are in right now, whether it's tornadoes in Nashville, Tennessee, or floods in Texas, or tsunamis in the Pacific, or yes, even COVID-19, anytime we're in these type of crisis, here's a question that people struggle with. Is this storm the judgment of God? Right now, where you're watching this service, you probably have asked this question at least once in the last two months. Is this God? Did God cause this? Is this storm the judgment of God? And look, I get it. That's an important question. And that question is only a helpful question if we have a proper understanding of God's judgment. See, if we view God's judgment as nothing more than punishment, then this is a dangerous question. And it will lead us to blaming God for all of the bad things that happen in the world. However, If we understand the purpose of God's judgment, I think this is a helpful question. See, the purpose of God's judgment is not to pay people back. It's to bring people back. The purpose of God's judgment is to bring people back to him, not to punish them necessarily for what they did. It's God's will, the Bible tells us, that no one should perish. So God is constantly trying to call people back to him. And so God wanted to save Nineveh. And he wanted to use his prophet Jonah to bring about his great purpose. So God tells Jonah, go. And Jonah said to God, no, I'm not going. Let's keep reading. Verse three. But Jonah got up and went where? In the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the part of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. And he brought a ticket and went on board. Look, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Now, I love maps. If you've connected with onechurch.tv before, you've heard me talk about my love affair of all things map. I spend an insane, a crazy person amount of time on Google Maps looking at different places. It's just my thing. I love road atlases. I love getting in them. I blame my father. He was a physician assistant who did house calls for insurance companies. And as a treat, sometimes my brother, myself, my sister, we would get to, nah, not so much my sister, just the boys. We would get to go ride with dad on his appointments. And he would ask me to, to plot out where he was going next, and he would quiz me on my cardinal directions, and he would tell me, okay, we're in Plant City. How, what's the quickest way to get from Plant City to St. Pete? And we would talk through all of those things. And this is, this is pre-smartphones and pre-Nintendo Switch. And so really, while my dad was inside in his appointment, the only thing that I could do was sit in the car, yes, with the windows cracked. Uh, thank God there was no cell phones. They probably would have called the police on my dad. But I'd sit in the car while he was inside in his appointment, and I would read through all these maps. And so to pass the time, I just fell in love with maps. What in the world does that have to do with Jonah? Here's what it is. I'm just trying to establish that I'm not a cartographer by any means, but one thing I do know is that Tarshish is in the opposite direction of Nineveh, completely opposite direction of Nineveh. God told Jonah to go. Jonah said no. And not only did Jonah say no, he traveled 2,500 miles in the opposite direction of where God wanted him to go. Maybe you're listening and you're still not getting what I'm saying. So let me take this story and bring it up to our modern times of a map. Jonah is roughly around Israel. God says, I want you to go from Israel to Iraq. And Jonah says, okay. And he buys a ticket for Spain. That's literally what happens. And he goes the opposite direction. Now be honest. How often have you found yourself in life thousands of miles figuratively from where you knew you should be? Some of you know God's called you to, in this season especially, to to be something more, to do something more, to look differently, to act differently. He's telling you to serve others. He's showing you the big step of faith you need to take. He's using this isolation that you've been in or are coming out of to really get you to focus on what really matters. He's calling you towards a better life, but instead you keep running in the opposite direction. Instead of taking God's journey, you run away, trying to escape from God. In Jonah's case, this trip should have taken him about 500 miles. Instead, he decided that it would be better to go five times that distance in the opposite direction. Let's keep reading. Verse four. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. So God tells Jonah, go. Jonah says, no. Jonah goes in the opposite direction. And God hurled a powerful wind 
wind. I love the picture of God like that closing pitcher on the mound in a Major League Baseball game, winding up and literally throwing with all of his might a storm. He threw a storm at Jonah. What's the worst storm that you've experienced physically? I'm from hurricane country, so I've been through my share of bad weather, tropical storms and and hurricanes and and, and you name it when it comes to lightning and and wind. And of course, being in middle Tennessee, we get our fair share of of bad winds and tornadoes and all of that stuff. So I think all of us can relate to uh, a weather-wise, a bad storm that we've been. I've even been in a sandstorm, if you can believe that. I've been in some tough weather. But in my life, I've also experienced the storms of life, the tough storms of life. And, And You might not know me watching the service. You may have just scrolled by and stopped here, but I'm just telling you, I'm not sitting up here trying to pontificate and give you a bunch of platitudes about how life is easy. Look, I've been through some stuff. I know what it's like to see family members suffer in their bodies physically. I know what it's like to see loved ones incarcerated. I know what it's like to lose children. I've lost two daughters. I know what it's like to lose both sets of my grandparents and both of my parents. I've experienced heartache and pain and all the storms that you can have with. And so this concept of storms is not something for me personally that lives in the abstract. My wife and I, we've, we've walked through it like I know so many of you watching and listening have walked through it as well. You've experienced bad weather literally, and you've experienced bad weather in, in the figurative sense as well. Does God always cause the storms that we experience? I I don't know. I don't want to sit here and act like I know the answer to that. Does God always cause the storms that we experience? I don't know. But here's what I do know. God can use a storm to stop us from destroying ourselves. I can't say whether or not God causes these things all of the time, but I know all of the time God can use a storm to stop us from destroying ourselves. In Jonah's case, God sent the storm to stop Jonah, even though it was Jonah who actually put himself in that situation in the first place. Here's the truth about storms. Some storms are sent. Some storms are caused. But all storms can be used by God for something better. Some storms are sent. Some are caused. But all storms can be used by God for something better. Let's keep reading in Jonah's story. Verse 5, fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. What is it about the Bible and people being asleep in the middle of the storm? This storm was violent. The ship was breaking apart. Everyone was freaking out. And Jonah was asleep. Now, unlike Jesus, who we've learned about in previous messages, unlike Jesus, who slept through a storm because he's the Savior, Jonah slept through the storm because he was selfish. Jonah was only worried about escaping from God and not going to Nineveh. And I love the question that captain asked him. How can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray. Listen, if you're watching this and you're a follower of Christ, I want you to know that the world looks to you in times of crisis. Your friends are looking to you. When everything goes dark, when the storm rages, it's one thing to have faith in God. That's a good thing. But it's terribly unloving to just pretend like we're not in the middle of a storm. How can we sleep when people need hope? How can we sleep when we have access to God through prayer? We should be hope dealers in the middle of times of darkness, not just resting on our blessed assurance, right? We should be doing something because people are looking for us. Sometimes the storm is actually a second chance to reach people who may not have been reached were it not for the storm. If you notice that conversation, the sailors are praying to their gods and it's not working. And then they tell Jonah, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll pay attention to us and spare us. We don't have time to unpack the rest of this story, so let me just sum it up for you. Here's what happens. The crew finds out that the storm is Jonah's fault and they throw him overboard. And as soon as Jonah hits the water, the storm immediately stops and the crew turns to Jonah's God. They actually turn to God and give God thanks. And then Jonah gets swallowed by a fish. Now, it's at this point that most people check out mentally of the story of Jonah. If you're watching this and you're kind of skeptical to this whole church thing, I'm with you, I get it. This is where the narrative gets pretty weird. 
swallowed by a fish and lived? Yeah, right. Was it a fish? Was it a whale? By the way, what types of fish are in the Mediterranean Sea anyway, right? These are all interesting questions, but we have to be careful to not turn the Bible into something that it is not. The Bible is not a science textbook. Now, science definitely confirms things that the Bible says, but the Bible isn't a science book. We also have to understand that Jesus himself used the story of Jonah in Matthew 12 as an illustration of his death, burial, and resurrection. So we shouldn't just dismiss the story. We also have to try to avoid finding natural answers to supernatural elements in the Bible. Bottom line, here's what we know about the fish. Are you ready? Let's look at verse 17. Now, the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Who arranged for the fish? The Lord, right? I ask you one more time. Who arranged for the fish? It was the Lord. God did. That's the point of the story. God wanted to stop Jonah from running away, so God sent a storm. And God wanted Jonah to stop being so selfish, so he sent a fish. And God gave Jonah a second chance by getting his attention through that storm. God needed Jonah isolated so that he could deal with him, so God arranged for a fish. Let me say this louder for the people who are not paying attention to me. I'm not saying that our global crisis happened because someone sinned. I'm not saying that you're enduring a storm right now in your home because you're running away from God. What I'm saying is that God will use the storm to get you to focus on someone else. He'll use the storm to get you isolated so that he can deal with you. He'll use your isolation so that you can focus on him. God may even allow life to swallow you up for a season in order to give you a second chance. What are you doing with your second chance? Here's what Jonah did. It's a long passage, and I'm just going to read it in its entirety. Verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish, He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you, with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. So in isolation, Jonah has this this realization of his failure, of how good God is. He realizes this second chance. He repents. He says, I'm sorry, God, I've blown it. I've messed up. And here's what happens. The fish spits Jonah up on the beach. And now Jonah has a choice to make. He could keep running, or he could be who God had called him to be, and go where God called him to go. Let's look at that in chapter three, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah, what? A second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I've given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. What's the rest of the story? Jonah warned the people of Nineveh, that they had 40-day notice, basically. 40 days to get right or God's gonna deal with you. And the people repented and everyone turned to God. And what would have been a disaster for the people of Nineveh turned into a story of hope, even if but for a moment. Jonah was given a second chance. The people of Nineveh were given a second chance and we all have been given a second chance. So what do we do with it? What do we do with our second chance? Very simple. When you make a mess in life, when you blow it, when you do the wrong thing, just confess, just own it. Everything changed in Jonah's story when he acknowledged his part. As soon as he's in that storm and the shipwreck's coming and he says, guys, it's my fault, they throw him overboard and the storm goes away. He gets swallowed by that well and he calls out to God, God, I've messed up, I've I've, I've gone the wrong way. And And he turns his heart and postures back towards God. He gets spit up and gets given that second chance. When you make a mess, 
confess. I love what the New Testament tells us, that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all wrongdoing. That means no matter what I've done, I have a God who's always willing, just like a series we just finished. I have this great father who's always ready to receive me back, to welcome me back home. But I have to take this step of saying, yep, it's me and owning that. So when you make a mess, just confess. And then when you're given a second chance, you need to move forward. You need to advance. To advance just means to move forward with purpose. And that's what happened to Jonah. He's given a second chance, and now he has to move into what God has for him. Don't waste your second chance. Many of us have been given a reset in how we do life, how we view our family, how we view our money, how we view our jobs, how we view our friends. Those things that we used to think were burdens and obligations, sometimes we find ourselves missing them in the season that we've been in these last couple months. Or things that we used to think were important, like meetings that could have been emails, now we realize, hey, I could probably just send a message and redeem that time. Either way, when you get a second chance, move forward. As things in our world start start to shift maybe a little bit back to something normal or at least something different from what it's been the last couple of months, let's be careful to not take steps backwards. When we're given a second chance, let's advance, let's move forward. And then finally, what do you do in the storm? When you're in a storm, transform. Let that storm change you. What we see in this story is several moments of transformation from being asleep to awake, from being selfish to being selfless, from being passive to active. When you're in the storm, don't let that storm beat you. Instead, use that storm to grow. Use that storm to become a healthier person, someone closer to God, continue to take steps towards growth. Let that storm transform you and make you into something better. Some storms are sent. Some storms are caused, but all storms can be used by God for something better. It's been said that the mighty palm tree It only gets stronger the harder the wind blows against it, It digs its roots down deeper, it transforms, it grows. Some storms are sent, some are caused, but all storms can be used by God for something better. I'm not saying that you're enduring the storm that you're currently in because you did something wrong. I'm not saying you're enduring the storm because God is out to get you. What I'm saying is that God will use the storm to get us to focus on others He'll use the storms to get us isolated so that we can see him. He'll use that isolation to get our eyes on him. And he may even allow life to swallow us for a season in order to give us second chance. Because sometimes the storm is actually our second chance. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your grace and goodness. Help us to see you in the middle of the storm that we may find ourselves in, to not use the relational frustrations, the financial strains, the health scare, to not use that, God, as a reason to run away, but a reason to lean into the wind and know that you are with us and that you are for us, and God, that you can use even the disaster for something bigger. Help us to be people who praise you consistently in the middle of the winds and the waves. And I thank you, God, that when we come to you, you respond with grace, with arms open, and you help us. God, for the person listening who's not said yes to you, right now, you know what they're facing, what they're going through. I pray, God, that you would speak to their hearts and they would say, God, forgive me, help me. I wanna follow you. And I thank you when they do that, God, you show up in the middle of their lives and you calm the raging storms. You bring peace. Thank you for that. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your
You're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, your promise still stands. Great is your faith. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Pastor Carlo is exactly right. Sometimes God gives storms so that we can have a second chance.
And some of you, you are needing that second chance now. And I would just encourage you, if you need to talk to a pastor, if you need to talk to a staff member, make sure to go on onechurch.tv or go on our Facebook page and communicate with us today because we want to help direct you so that you can take your next step. Let me give you a couple of next steps you can do right now. First one is simply this. Our five after is going to be coming up in about five minutes after. And it's a great way that Pastor Carlo and Pastor Luther, they're going to be dialoguing about how the message today, how God wants to give us all a second chance in the midst of the storms. Make sure to check that out. Secondly, if you have students or kids, we love families here at OneChurch.tv. And you can go to our website, OneChurch.tv slash kids or OneChurch.tv slash students. And we have a plethora of resources on there for your students, preschoolers, elementary age. They're going to love it. And parents, you will too. So thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We'll see you next week.